Welcome to the Tim Booker book sharing channel. Like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell so you don't miss our updates. Let's explore the world of books together. Today I will interpret for you The Noonday Demon, subtitled An Atlas of Depression. This is a very personal book written by Andrew Solomon, a writer. Despite his elite academic background, having earned a bachelor's degree in literature from Yale University and master's and PhD degrees in psychology from the University of Cambridge, Solomon is also a depression sufferer. During his youth, he experienced his mother's suicide, and after her death, he found himself accompanied by depression. Solomon started writing this book based on his own experience with depression and then delved into the depression of others, exploring it in different contexts. In 1998, he published an article about depression in a magazine, receiving thousands of letters from readers. From this pool of readers, he selected the first interviewees for this book. One of his goals in writing this book is empathy, hoping to help people truly understand those who suffer from depression. Depression is not only an individual struggle but also a societal issue. According to the World Health Organization, there are over 300 million depression sufferers worldwide. Reading this book allows us to see how the most desperate individuals face the hardships of life and the darkest moments in their existence. This is also a comprehensive book that goes beyond typical discussions on the causes of depression. While other authors may approach the topic from a scientific, philosophical, or psychological standpoint, The Noonday Demon integrates perspectives from medicine, psychology, literature, history, and politics, presenting a broader picture related to depression. To write this book, Solomon interviewed numerous depression sufferers, as well as medical professionals, scientists, policymakers, philosophers, and more. Another goal of his writing was to establish a systematic understanding of depression research based on empirical evidence, rather than drawing generalized conclusions from anecdotes. In the writing process, Solomon found another significance for this book. He encountered resilient, intelligent, and tenacious individuals with depression, whose stories helped him comprehend the complexity of human resilience. Consequently, he chose to depict people he admired in the book rather than those who made him feel less positive. He believes that the book's purpose is to create a more protective environment for outstanding individuals and their success stories. Solomon is confident that these stories that helped him can also assist others. The book was initially published in 2001 and received the National Book Award for Nonfiction that year. It has since been translated into over 20 languages and became a global bestseller. In 2016, the author added a chapter updating various developments since the book's publication. While many depression sufferers found solace in this book, Solomon emphasizes that it cannot replace proper diagnosis and treatment. In the book, he introduces two main modes of treating depression, talk therapy, involving verbal communication and physiological interventions, including medication and electroconvulsive therapy. Talk therapy originates from psychoanalysis, with Freud as its founder, and encompasses an understanding of profound human complexity, a strong resistance against self-denial, and respect for life's hardships. We all experience life's challenges and strive to find moments of happiness. However, for some, depression becomes a mechanism of despair. As the author describes it in the book, experiencing decline, feeling exposed to the erosion of rain almost every day, realizing increasing vulnerability, and knowing that parts of oneself will be scattered with the first strong wind, these are all profoundly unpleasant experiences. The book consists of 13 chapters, starting with depression, followed by breakdown, and then expanding the perspective with chapters on treatment, alternative therapies, and progressing to broader themes such as crowds, addiction, suicide, history, poverty, politics, and evolution. The twelfth chapter finally touches on hope, and the last chapter is titled Afterward. The later Solomon no longer feels as terrible as during his depression, he discovers that depression is like a season, cyclically recurring. He prepares for its return and learns to sketch spring when it seems about to freeze. In the hope chapter, Solomon advises individuals dealing with depression that the most important thing to remember during this period is that lost time cannot be regained. Every second lost during the illness will never return. Regardless of how terrible you feel, you must exert every effort to keep going, even if all you can do at the moment is breathe. Be patient and fill the waiting time as much as possible. Seize the moment, don't wish your life away. 
Even the moments that feel like they are about to explode are still moments in your life, and once lost, they are gone forever. Today's interpretation has three parts. The first part explores Solomon's life-changing experience with his mother's suicide and his thoughts on suicide. The next two parts address common misconceptions about depression. The second part examines the historical aspects of depression, challenging the misconception that depression is a modern ailment. The third part dispels the notion that depression is an ailment of the affluent, emphasizing its association with poverty. Okay, let's move on to the first part. Let's delve into Solomon's story, where the word, suicide, frequently appears in his life. Solomon was born in 1963, and at the age of nine, he became aware of suicide for the first time. That year, a classmate's father of his younger brother committed suicide. When Solomon's family discussed the matter, his mother explained to the children that some people encounter problems they can't solve on their own, and in the end, they can't bear to continue living. She emphasized that they must bravely live through their lives and endure. During his youth, Solomon had several acquaintances who also took their own lives. In 1989, Solomon's mother was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. During the first week of hospitalization, she announced her intention to commit suicide. Initially, it was just her expression of anger at her unfortunate circumstances, but as the chemotherapy proved ineffective, suicide became an actual plan. She told her family that if they loved her, they should help her escape from this miserable situation. One day, a year later, Solomon called home to inquire about his mother's condition. His father replied that they would continue the current treatment while exploring other options. The phrase, other options, here was understood by the family. Solomon's mother had already acquired enough medication, and she stated that if there was even a faint hope of recovery, she would continue treatment, but if there was no hope, she would choose suicide. Over the next eight months, his mother experienced vomiting, palpitations, hair loss, unhealed mouth ulcers, allergies, and tremors. She decided to end her life on June 19, 1991, at the age of 58. On that rainy day, Solomon and his younger brother returned home together. The mother, father, and son were together, and she consumed forty pills and a glass of vodka. She told her family that she wanted to envelop them with her love, protecting them from any terrible things in the world, hoping her love would provide a happy and safe place for them. She told Solomon that the best gift he could give her as a son was to continue living a beautiful and fulfilling life, enjoying everything he had. After his mother's death, Solomon sorted through her belongings. In the bathroom, there were tools for caring for a wig, bottles of painkillers, and vitamins. When he saw the medications used for suicide, he pocketed the bottles, thinking that if one day he suffered from illness and despair, these pills might come in handy. Ten days later, his father called and asked how his son had dealt with those pills. Solomon replied that he had thrown them away. His father said, you have no right to throw them away. Those pills were left for me just in case I might need them if I ever get sick. At that moment, Solomon understood what the contagion of suicide really meant. For this family, it seemed that by planning to take the remaining pills, a connection of some sort could be re-established with the mother. It took several years before this idea was abandoned by the father and son. After his mother's death, Solomon began psychoanalysis to help control his grief. However, by 1993, his lover had left him, his psychoanalyst announced retirement, and Solomon lost sensitivity, no longer caring about love, work, family, or friends. In June 1994, Solomon started experiencing continuous fatigue. Despite his childhood dream of becoming a writer, he felt no excitement when his first novel was published in the UK. In August, he had a sudden kidney stone, worsening his condition. On the eve of his 31st birthday, Solomon completely collapsed. He lay in his house for two days without eating, and his father came to help. Solomon started taking medication and then moved into his father's residence. In the grip of depression, even the thought of taking a shower made him feel powerless and fearful, questioning, why can't I do what everyone else in the world is doing, showering? Solomon doesn't know if he would have experienced a mental breakdown without losing his mother. The line between when depression triggers life events and when life events trigger depression is blurry. Solomon addresses this question in the book, 
stating that the boundaries between the two are often indistinct and mutually reinforcing. For instance, an unhappy marriage may trigger disastrous life events, leading to depression, and depression, in turn, can trigger unhealthy relationships. He introduces a study from the University of Pittsburgh in the book, the first major depressive episode is usually closely related to life events. As episodes recur, the association diminishes, and by the fourth or fifth episode, life events seem to have no impact. In other words, external events initially trigger vulnerability, but beyond a certain point, depression becomes detached from life events, becoming entirely random and spontaneous. However, among those who have experienced unfortunate events, only about one-fifth will develop depression. During Solomon's most severe depressive episode, suicidal thoughts were persistent, but he did not have the impulse to commit suicide. The desire to die and the actual act of committing suicide are separated by a significant distance. While suicidal tendencies are considered a crucial indicator of mental illness, Solomon believes that there is no clear equation between depression and suicide, they do not cause each other but often coexist as independent entities that influence each other. In the book, he introduces the surprising fact that nearly half of those involved in suicide cases in the United States had received treatment from psychiatric professionals but still unexpectedly ended their own lives. The severity of depression does not necessarily correlate strongly with the likelihood of suicide, some mildly depressed individuals may take their own lives, while others in extreme circumstances persist in living. Solomon, being a writer, would use literary quotations and philosophical contemplation to articulate his feelings when accompanied by depression. For instance, he found solace in the words of the philosopher Schopenhauer, suicide may be regarded as an experiment, a question which man puts to nature, trying to force her to answer. The question is this, what change will death produce in a man's existence and in his insight into the nature of things? When Solomon contemplated suicide and wondered what would happen after death, Schopenhauer's perspective made him realize that death would extinguish his curiosity. This thought process motivated him to continue living. Solomon says, I can give up everything in my life, but I cannot give up my confusion. Another phrase that helped Solomon resist suicidal thoughts was, live through this moment, and I can always end my life in the next. Understanding this enabled him not to be completely overwhelmed by thoughts of suicide. In the book, Solomon states that the more a person contemplates rational suicide, the more likely they are to avoid irrational suicide. Now, there is a popular view that considers depression as a modern disease. In the author's opinion, this is completely wrong. Our understanding and control of emotions and personality have been continuously developing from ancient times to the present. Next, we enter the second part to explore the history of depression. The book introduces that in the Western world, the history of depression is closely related to the history of thought and can be roughly divided into five main stages. The first stage is ancient times, where the Greek physician Hippocrates in ancient Greece believed that depression is essentially a brain disease and can be treated with oral medication. The second stage is the medieval period when depression was stigmatized, and those with depression were seen as losing the favor of God. The third stage is the Renaissance period when depression was romanticized, and the decadence of genius artists was seen as insight. The fourth stage is the scientific age of the 17th to 19th centuries, where people explored the composition and function of the brain through experiments, attempting to control the mind with biological strategies. The fifth stage is from the early 20th century to the present, witnessing two significant movements in understanding and treating depression, psychobiology and psychoanalysis. Now, let's focus on the fourth and fifth stages. In the late 17th and early 18th centuries, as science advanced rapidly, scientific explanations about the body and mind accelerated. It was an era of rationalism, where the inability to maintain mental health was considered self-indulgence, putting individuals at a disadvantage in society. The author states in the book, in the 18th century, mental patients were outsiders without rights or status. Those with delusions and depression faced tremendous social suppression. Once you showed signs of mental abnormality, you would spend the rest of your life in a mental hospital. Because you were like a captured rhinoceros, no longer capable of human rationality. Compared to schizophrenic patients, those with depression were generally more docile and subjected to less abuse. 
The treatment for depressed individuals at that time involved inflicting physical pain to divert their attention from mental suffering, with common methods including drowning the depressed or using rotating devices to induce fainting and vomiting. In this context, people experiencing depression had to live covertly. An English writer named Boswell wrote letters to friends describing his depressive state, expressing, My melancholy has reached the most astonishing and tormenting degree. I have fallen into the abyss, and my mind is full of dark thoughts. I am interested in nothing, everything seems dull and meaningless. Boswell insisted on writing ten lines a day, describing his experiences while going through depression to keep himself alert. By the late 18th century, with the rise of Romanticism, the status of melancholy was elevated again, viewed as a state with insight. Poets like Keats, Shelley, Goethe, and later Baudelaire, all depicted the beauty of melancholy. In addition to poetry, there was a philosophical thread. Hegel, in the early 19th century, told us, history is not the fertile soil for the growth of happiness. Happy periods in it are the blank pages of history. There are moments of satisfaction in the history of the world, but satisfaction is not happiness. Hegel denied the pursuit of happiness as a matter of course. The Danish philosopher Kierkegaard found magical solace in his own suffering, saying, in extreme melancholy, I also love life because I love my melancholy. He stated, what is rare is not that someone falls into despair, far from it. What is extremely rare is that someone never truly falls into despair. Another pessimistic philosopher was Schopenhauer, who did not believe that suffering makes people noble. In his view, creatures in the world spend their time in anxiety and desire, enduring terrible pain until finally falling into the hands of death. In the 19th century, individuals who had lived like animals due to mental illness, transformed back into humans. The classification of mental illnesses became more detailed, and the mental health care system for psychiatric patients was established. Most mental health care institutions categorized patients, distinguishing those likely to recover from those with no hope of cure. In 1807, 2.26 out of every 10,000 people in Britain were judged insane, with severe depressives included in this category. By 1890, this number had risen to 29.63 people. This change was partly due to an increasing willingness to acknowledge mental disorders in loved ones. The author notes, if, during hospitalization, some people's conditions could indeed improve, then no matter who might be on the brink of a life of misery, sending them to a place that could potentially save them almost became a duty. The fifth stage of the history of depression is from the early 20th century to the present. In the 20th century, there were two major movements in understanding and treating depression, psychobiology and psychoanalysis. Emil Kreppelin, a German psychiatrist, was the pioneer of psychobiology. He first proposed that all mental illnesses have an underlying biochemical basis, with depression being primarily caused by genetic defects. He believed that 70% to 80% of cases were genetically determined. However, the prescriptions he offered were simply rest, increased consumption of opium and morphine, and various dietary restrictions. Freud, the father of psychoanalysis, viewed depression as a form of mourning stemming from the loss of sensations of appetite or libido. His student Abraham further suggested that the onset of depression is an invitation to a disappointment in love, such as when an infant desires milk, and the refusal from the mother after weaning leads to disappointment that could potentially harm one's self-love. In other words, for mental illnesses, Kreppelin proposed a genetic determinism, while Freudians introduced an infancy experience determinism. Dr. Adolf Meyer from the United States disagreed with both views. He believed that mental patients might have a genetic predisposition, but heredity does not mean immutability. Humans have an infinite capacity for adaptation, capable of discarding erroneous ideas and learning to live in a way that reduces the likelihood of mental illness. Meyer was the outstanding director of psychiatry of his time in the United States. In 1909, he became the director of the newly established psychiatric center at Johns Hopkins Medical School. He established mental health clinics led by psychiatrists responsible for the prevention, treatment, and follow-up care of psychiatric patients. Psychiatrists collaborated with schools, police departments, and social welfare departments to reduce ignorance and fear of mental patients. As mentioned earlier, Hippocrates believed that depression is essentially a brain disease that can be treated with oral medication. 
In the 20th century, scientific advances in medicine seemed to validate Hippocrates' view as humanity discovered the formula for treating depression. The principle of antidepressant drugs is to change patients' perceptions and behaviors by adjusting the levels of certain substances in the brain. In 1933, serotonin was isolated. In 1954, researchers proposed that serotonin in the brain might be related to emotional function. In 1965, a theory was put forward, emotions are regulated by norepinephrine, adrenaline, and dopamine together. By that time, it was already known that norepinephrine, adrenaline, dopamine, serotonin, and others belong to the category of chemicals called monoamines. New drugs that effectively increased the levels of monoamines in the blood were developed. In 1972, the pharmaceutical company Eli Lilly developed a serotonin drug originally intended as a hypotensive drug but had no significant effect. Later, Lilly considered the possibility of using this drug as an antidepressant. In 1987, this drug was marketed under the name Prozac, and in the following decade, various antidepressant drugs were introduced. The book introduces that the most popular antidepressant drugs on the market today are SSRIs, which can increase serotonin levels in the brain, and Prozac belongs to this category. However, the author also warns that the popularity of these drugs is not due to their outstanding efficacy but rather their low side effects, high safety, and almost impossibility to be used for suicide. This is an important factor to consider when treating individuals with depression. The author explains that the entire American society likes to say that depression is caused by internal chemical processes beyond the patient's control. Therefore, treatment options for thoughts are no longer effective. However, in mid-20th century continental Europe, a new philosophical thought based on solitude was born, especially the existentialist thoughts of writers such as Camus, Sartre, and Beckett. Camus said, The world is absurd, neither offering a reason to continue living nor a reason to end life. Sartre, through the protagonist in his book, said, I exist, the world exists, and I know that the world exists. This makes no difference to me, nothing makes a difference to me. Beckett wrote in his novel, Whether I was born or not, lived or not, dead or dying, what does it matter? I will continue to do what I have always done, not knowing what I am doing, who I am, where I am, or whether I exist. These writers were not just complaining without cause, they described the psychological state of people in an absurd world. Existential psychoanalysis has always been dealing with life issues, loneliness, a sense of meaninglessness, and anxiety about death. If we are always in an uncomfortable state, could external unfavorable environments cause reactive depression? There is no definitive answer in medicine, but it could be a reason why healthy individuals pay attention to depression. People may occasionally experience depressive emotions and fatigue. The reason people can empathize with those with depression is that everyone has to face their own suffering in existence. We enter the third part to explore the relationship between depression and poverty. If a person who is free from worries about clothing and food is attacked by depression, his life will undergo significant changes. There will be no desire to work, unable to be efficient, feeling a loss of control, and unable to achieve anything. Typically, this situation attracts the attention of friends and family. However, when a person in the lower social strata is afflicted by depression, it may not be as obvious. Depression transcends social classes, but the treatment of depression is not universal. Solomon states that compared to the general population, depression is more common in those below the poverty line, especially in people receiving social welfare assistance, with their depression incidence being three times that of the general population. In the trend of medicalizing depression, assuming it to be an endogenous disease unrelated to external material conditions, Solomon believes that the truth is different. A significant portion of the impoverished population in the United States is troubled by depression. They face economic difficulties, poor family relationships, lack of proper education, and no hobbies to distract themselves from sadness and pain. Poverty easily triggers depression, and alleviating poverty can aid in the recovery from depression. However, in the United States, there is no consistent and unified approach to identify and treat depression in the impoverished population. In the book, we see a set of data stating that 13.7% of Americans live below the poverty line. 
Among the household heads receiving family assistance with children, approximately 42% meet the diagnostic criteria for clinical depression, exceeding the national average by twice. The U.S. federal and state governments transfer around $20 billion annually to the impoverished population and their children, and spend a similar amount on food stamps for these families. Solomon estimates that if the U.S. government could provide effective treatment for depression to the welfare population, enabling most of them to return to work, it could save approximately 8% of welfare costs annually. According to the book, welfare officials in the U.S. do not conduct systematic screenings for depression, and welfare programs are mostly executed by administrative personnel who are not extensively involved in social work. Solomon mentions that research on depression among the impoverished is ongoing, and experiences show that many issues faced by impoverished individuals with depression can be managed. Those who have emerged from severe depression, regardless of how dreadful their initial situation was, start climbing towards a normal life. Solomon reminds us that there are two characteristics when depression encounters poverty. The first characteristic is normalization. Resource scarcity and poverty can make people passive, and depression is very common among the impoverished to the extent that it goes unnoticed and unquestioned, leading to its normalization. Depressed impoverished individuals attribute their suffering to external factors, believe that external factors cannot be changed, and assume that internal factors cannot change either. The second characteristic when depression encounters poverty is physical symptoms. When the middle class is depressed, they typically experience intense guilt and share their feelings of failure with others. However, depression in the impoverished is different. Their illness manifests as clear physical symptoms, such as insomnia, fatigue, nausea, fear, and an inability to connect with others. These issues make them susceptible to illness. Convincing depressed individuals that their dismal life and depression can be separated, and persuading them to believe that their despondency can be treated, is extremely challenging. After the poverty chapter, Solomon naturally transitions to the next chapter, politics. He states that in recent years, there have been changes in the U.S. government's policies on depression, and many other countries are also making changes. Why is there a change? Solomon explains that four factors influence people's perceptions of depression, subsequently affecting related policies at the governmental level. The first factor is medicalization. In the past, Americans believed that a person's illness due to their character weaknesses did not require treatment. However, now, emotional disorders are treated as medical conditions, relieving patients of responsibility. The second factor is simplifying depression. For thousands of years, people have struggled to clearly define what depression is. However, the prevailing view now is that, just like low insulin levels leading to diabetes, depression is a result of low serotonin levels. The FDA and pharmaceutical companies have reinforced this simplified idea. The third factor is brain imaging. By comparing brain images of depressed individuals with those of normal brains, it becomes evident that the brains of depressed individuals are gray, while those of happy individuals are colorful. This striking contrast is sufficient to convince people of the necessity of treatment. The last factor is the efforts of some mental health advocacy groups in the United States, dedicated to fighting for the rights of depressed individuals. Solomon states that treating depression is very expensive. His first mental breakdown took five months, cost $4,000 for a psychopharmacologist, $10,000 for talk therapy, and $3,500 for medication. Some depressed individuals, without hospitalization, spend about $20,000 per year to maintain mental health. Even for the simplest depression, it costs $2,000 per year. The struggle each person faces when dealing with depression is individual, and how healthcare policies address this individuality remains a complex issue. Currently, many countries adopt a dual approach to physical and mental health, incorporating physiological treatments into the insurance system, with individuals bearing the cost of psychological therapy. We enter the third part to explore the relationship between depression and poverty. If a person who is free from worries about clothing and food is attacked by depression, his life will undergo significant changes. There will be no desire to work, unable to be efficient, feeling a loss of control, and unable to achieve anything. Typically, this situation attracts the attention of friends and family. 
However, when a person in the lower social strata is afflicted by depression, it may not be as obvious. Depression transcends social classes, but the treatment of depression is not universal. Solomon states that compared to the general population, depression is more common in those below the poverty line, especially in people receiving social welfare assistance, with their depression incidence being three times that of the general population. In the trend of medicalizing depression, assuming it to be an endogenous disease unrelated to external material conditions, Solomon believes that the truth is different. A significant portion of the impoverished population in the United States is troubled by depression. They face economic difficulties, poor family relationships, lack of proper education, and no hobbies to distract themselves from sadness and pain. Poverty easily triggers depression, and alleviating poverty can aid in the recovery from depression. However, in the United States, there is no consistent and unified approach to identify and treat depression in the impoverished population. In the book, we see a set of data stating that 13.7% of Americans live below the poverty line. Among the household heads receiving family assistance with children, approximately 42% meet the diagnostic criteria for clinical depression, exceeding the national average by twice. The U.S. federal and state governments transfer around $20 billion annually to the impoverished population and their children, and spend a similar amount on food stamps for these families. Solomon estimates that if the U.S. government could provide effective treatment for depression to the welfare population, enabling most of them to return to work, it could save approximately 8% of welfare costs annually. According to the book, welfare officials in the U.S. do not conduct systematic screenings for depression, and welfare programs are mostly executed by administrative personnel who are not extensively involved in social work. Solomon mentions that research on depression among the impoverished is ongoing, and experiences show that many issues faced by impoverished individuals with depression can be managed. Those who have emerged from severe depression, regardless of how dreadful their initial situation was, start climbing towards a normal life. Solomon reminds us that there are two characteristics when depression encounters poverty. The first characteristic is normalization. Resource scarcity and poverty can make people passive and depression is very common among the impoverished to the extent that it goes unnoticed and unquestioned, leading to its normalization. Depressed impoverished individuals attribute their suffering to external factors, believe that external factors cannot be changed, and assume that internal factors cannot change either. The second characteristic when depression encounters poverty is physical symptoms. When the middle class is depressed, they typically experience intense guilt and share their feelings of failure with others. However, depression in the impoverished is different. Their illness manifests as clear physical symptoms, such as insomnia, fatigue, nausea, fear, and an inability to connect with others. These issues make them susceptible to illness. Convincing depressed individuals that their dismal life and depression can be separated, and persuading them to believe that their despondency can be treated, is extremely challenging. After the poverty chapter, Solomon naturally transitions to the next chapter, politics. He states that in recent years, there have been changes in the U.S. government's policies on depression, and many other countries are also making changes. Why is there a change? Solomon explains that four factors influence people's perceptions of depression, subsequently affecting related policies at the governmental level. The first factor is medicalization. In the past, Americans believed that a person's illness due to their character weaknesses did not require treatment. However, now, emotional disorders are treated as medical conditions, relieving patients of responsibility. The second factor is simplifying depression. For thousands of years, people have struggled to clearly define what depression is. However, the prevailing view now is that, just like low insulin levels leading to diabetes, depression is a result of low serotonin levels. The FDA and pharmaceutical companies have reinforced this simplified idea. The third factor is brain imaging. By comparing brain images of depressed individuals with those of normal brains, it becomes evident that the brains of depressed individuals are gray, while those of happy individuals are colorful. This striking contrast is sufficient to convince people of the necessity of treatment. The last factor is the efforts of some mental health advocacy groups in the United States, dedicated to fighting for the rights of depressed individuals. Solomon states that treating depression is very expensive. 
His first mental breakdown took five months, cost $4,000 for a psychopharmacologist, $10,000 for talk therapy, and $3,500 for medication. Some depressed individuals, without hospitalization, spend about $20,000 per year to maintain mental health. Even for the simplest depression, it costs $2,000 per year. The struggle each person faces when dealing with depression is individual, and how healthcare policies address this individuality remains a complex issue. Currently, many countries adopt a dual approach to physical and mental health, incorporating physiological treatments into the insurance system, with individuals bearing the cost of psychological therapy. The essence of the Noonday Demon has been interpreted for you here, and let's summarize the key points of this issue. First, after Andrew Solomon's mother's suicide, he began psychoanalysis, later diagnosed with depression, and has been accompanied by it ever since. Solomon discovered that the opposite of depression is not happiness but vitality. Depression is like a season, and he prepares for its arrival, learning to sketch spring when it is about to freeze. Solomon wrote this book with the hope that the stories that helped him could also help others, and indeed, the book has achieved that. In public, strangers often hug Solomon because the stories he tells in the book alleviate their sense of loneliness. Solomon also frequently receives letters of gratitude from people with depression, with his favorite one saying, I was going to commit suicide, but I read your book and changed my mind. Second, his mother's suicide was a major upheaval in Solomon's life, and he went through a brief period of quasi-suicidal tendencies. However, in his view, there is no simple equation between depression and suicide, they do not cause each other but often coexist and mutually influence each other. He believes that the more one contemplates rational suicide, the more likely they are to avoid irrational suicide. Third, depression is not a modern disease. Solomon traces the historical concepts of depression in the book. Ancient physicians believed that depression was essentially a brain disease, but it was stigmatized during the Dark Middle Ages. During the Renaissance, depression was romanticized, but in the 18th century, depressed individuals faced harsh treatment. It wasn't until the establishment of the mental asylum system in the 19th century that psychiatric patients could receive inpatient treatment. Nowadays, people like to say that depression is caused by internal chemical processes beyond the control of the patients, and antidepressant medications are popular. Fourth, depression is not a disease of the wealthy, it is often associated with poverty. Solomon, using the example of the United States, tells us that poverty easily triggers depression, and alleviating poverty can help people recover from depression. However, how to alleviate poverty, how to treat depression in the impoverished, and how to incorporate the cost of treating depression into the healthcare insurance system remain complex issues. The above is the entire content of this audio issue. Please subscribe to the Tim Booker channel, like, and share this valuable knowledge with your friends. Let's combine wisdom and practice, achieve our financial goals, and create a better future together. Thank you, everyone, goodbye.